Well, good morning. Welcome to the gathering. If you want to stand up, you can. We're going to start off with one song this morning. Great things. We're reminded in Scripture that God does great things. That every good and perfect gift that shows up in our life, something that brings us joy or something maybe that we just needed, where we could almost call it a miracle, those are great things. And those are worthy of celebrating. We call that worship. We know how to worship because we know how to celebrate people. We do it all the time. In a sense, we're worshiping them in that moment. So this is a chance for us to give thanks back to God for all the good things that he does for us. Come let us worship. Come let us worship. Oh, wasn't that a great intro? Yeah, the key was wrong. Isn't that great? So one of the things you'll learn if you're new to this place is... We embrace those moments. Mistakes are good, because we all make them. Now we're in the right key. Come let us worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. have a seat. Test. There we go. Well, church can get very, very predictable. Very, very predictable. You come into a place and we do this then and we do this next and we do this next and we do this next. And everything that I know about Jesus as you follow him, it's, it's unpredictable. It's surprising. And um, so we're adjusting things around a little bit um, this morning. So let me just point out a few things for any of you who are visiting for the first time. Um, yeah, I'm not wearing shoes. Yes, I'm not wearing shoes. And it's not being disrespectful. It's not um, being irreverent. 
We talked a long time ago about how Jesus is in us. The Spirit of God is in us. That means wherever we are is sacred ground. It's holy ground. When Moses was confronted by God, he took his shoes off. So that's why Peter's not wearing shoes, to remind us that God is here. This is sacred space. Um, As you come in, we don't pass an offering plate, so we have a treasury box back here. So if you want to have an offering, tithes and offerings, feel free to put that in there. And it's just part of worship. So if you feel led to do that, um, go to that space. We have a candle table back there. If you want to light a candle, pray for somebody. We have a prayer wall back there. If you've got a prayer request, you can write it on there. Stick it in the wall if you want to go back there at any time. And you can pray over those by pulling one out or praying over the whole thing. So it's a time to, to worship. So please feel free. Pews can seem very restrictive and confining. And so I want to encourage us at any time to feel free to get up and go do one of those things. We're going to take communion in a minute, right at the very beginning. And usually in church, you do it at the end. And we're going to do it at the beginning, and I'll explain why. So here, we believe that following Jesus is the best way to live. And we're learning how to live and love like him together in our everyday lives. As we come in here on a Sunday, this is a response to a life we're living. This isn't supposed to be the only moment. This is actually a moment where we get to come in and celebrate the life that we're living. And for much of the world, they think that this is the moment. And for us, this is a special moment. We're called to gather, and we get to live into the life of Jesus in this moment in many, many ways. I don't know if you notice it, but Jesus, he had three rhythms in his life. He had a devotional life. He spent time alone with his father. He'd steal away. He'd be quiet. He lived according to all of God's purposes. And even spent time in the temple with scripture, teaching it. So he valued God's word. He valued prayer. It says in scripture, he didn't do anything that the father didn't tell him to do. And he lived a life of worship. He had a connectional life. He invited men and women to follow him closely as disciples. They connected. They shared experiences together. They grew together. And then he challenged them to go do the same thing in the lives of others. And then Jesus lived a missional life. And you're going to get to experience that today in just the passage we're going to talk about today. Very missional moment where he went out to the world, those that marginalized, those that were seeking, and he lived missionally. So as we have this moment together on a Sunday, we get to practice a lot of things that I'm hoping we're going to live into in our daily life. And many of you are doing that, and you may not even recognize it. But this church moment is a response, and as I keep saying every week, I think it's a chance for us to realign our hearts with God's heart and begin to live the way that he would want us to live each and every day. But know that as I gather with you in this moment, I love this moment because we're all together. We're all together, and I hope to see all of you a lot during the week, and this is a great moment just to be together as family and community. So, in the book of Acts, it talks about the response of the early followers of Jesus, and they didn't even call themselves a church. It was a whole bunch of people gathering, and they were devoted to one another, and they did life together. And one of the things it says in Scripture that they did every day is they broke bread. And in the church, we've made this like, oh, we do it once a month, or we do it, you know, we've ritualized it. And it is sacred in what it represents. However, it was done every day to remind them of what Jesus had been and done for them and the way in which they were called to live. They did it together Every day. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to start with that this morning because the whole reason we're here is because of Jesus and what he did, right? That's the whole reason we're here. We wouldn't even be in the space if he hadn't lived and died for us. So I've asked Trevor to come on up. So Trevor, come on up over here. And I've asked Isaac to come up today. And uh, we're going to start off with communion. So if you haven't done that in a long time, or maybe you haven't done it here, um, we'll just come up whenever you're ready. Feel free to come up. And they're just going to say, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ for you. And you can take the bread and you can dip it in the cup and eat it. Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. And then if you're uh, living in the germ zone still, and COVID is still here and flus are going around, we have those plastic ones there, so please feel free to grab one of those. And then some of us like to prepare our hearts before we come up, so if you're one of those people, and I encourage that, back there at the table. Uh, Tiffany, can you just stand up and walk to that table? There's a candle lit and there's a prayer right there. So if you want to go back there first... And pray that prayer or pray it on your way back. Please feel free to do it. So we come up this way and we peel off. So let me pray and then uh, we'll, we'll break bread. We'll start there. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the life that he lived, the life that he gave, and his victory over death for us. And we are so grateful for that because it covers everything that we struggle with. It lifts everything that we struggle with off our shoulders so that we can live a full life. We thank you for that grace. We thank you for that mercy. We thank you for his words. This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you for his words. A cup blessed. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So feel free. Come up whenever you want.
I mentioned last week that um, I had found myself um, incredibly busy, incredibly burdened with just so many things that life can bring, family, just all this stuff. And I wasn't taking the time to spend time alone and quiet in the presence of God. And so I felt like all the burdens of my life and my world were on me. And it's exhausting to do that. So I believe in being very transparent with you. Um, leaders, leadership team, we had a vision dinner on, on Friday. And um, I hit a wall this week physically. Like, at first I thought I was sick. But I was so tired. I was so tired. And I couldn't figure out what it was. I took COVID tests. I'm taking my temperature. Um, Betsy and I went on a bike ride. I loved riding my bike. I only got four miles out, and I felt like I'd ridden 50. And my body was telling me, Peter, you got to stop. You got to stop. And I had to give myself permission to rest, to be still, and to be quiet. And then I had to realize I've been just doing a devotional time every morning quickly and then diving into the list of my day. And I wasn't honoring this just idea of being quiet and being still and letting God be God in my life. And I don't know if you're feeling that at all, um, but I've been tired in my heart. I've been weary in my mind, and I've been weary in my soul, and it affected my body. Um, so as we sing this next song, we, we sing this quite a bit here. Um, it's just called Be Still. And I just pray that the, the words of this song would, um, would speak to you, and maybe it can be a prayer. And maybe you know somebody who needs this right now. Maybe you're all well, good, and rested, and having still moments. But, but maybe you know somebody. Maybe you can sing this for them as we sing it. Another mistake. Isn't that awesome? Be still and know that the Lord is in control. Be still, my soul, stand as much as giants fall. I won't be afraid, for you are here. You silence all my Still, my 
Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, uh, for who you are. Lord, we forget often that, that you're actually the one that is in control of everything, and we have this idea that we are. We take responsibility for much that we're not supposed to. We forget you and dive into our lives and all that it brings. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would draw us close to you even now in this moment. I pray whatever burdens are being carried by anybody in this room right now, that they would lift them up to you. That they would give them to you. That they would feel safe to do so. That they would know that your love and your grace and your mercy are in abundance in ways that the world does not offer. So Lord, I pray this morning that we would know that we are loved, that we are dearly loved, and there is a kindness and a gentleness and a compassion, a rest waiting for each one of us. It's a rest that's waiting for each one of us, and I pray that we would receive it. Uh, Lord, as we've honored you already with some words and some songs, Lord, I pray that it was pleasing to you, and I pray that you continue to be with us, be in this place, in your fullness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this is what we do here right now. We're going to take a space in the middle here because we value relationships. And I believe there are things in our lives that bring us joy and we forget them. <laughs> so here's what you do. You're going to go to somebody in the room you do not know. And I know there's people in this room that do not know other people. So don't go to the people you already know. So go to somebody you do not know. Introduce yourself and then ask them what brought you joy this week. And then reciprocate. And we'll reconvene in a little bit. Ready? Go. What brought you joy this week?
Do you use this at all, or do you just do that? Okay, I'll get this out of your way. All right. All right, boys and girls. If we can, we can start heading back to our seats. I love the conversations. Love the conversations. I love it, I love it, I love it. So I would encourage you guys to continue these conversations. You know, when this gathering's over, you could like go to lunch. You could have coffee, you could hang out. Or you could go, I want to get to know you more. I would encourage you uh, to do that. So um, I'm the announcement guy this morning. So if you have a bulletin, if you got it when you came in, they're on the table and we pass them out. Um, but we try to make it really convenient for you on the back. Um, is pretty much everything that's kind of going on here as we try to do life together and fight for life together and being consistent and being around each other. Um, there is a connection card in there, and I encourage us to fill that out so we can get to know you as you get to know us. And we send out emails during the week and kind of use that as a way of connecting with folks. And so um, if you want to get those emails, it would be great to fill out one of those. So um, first of all, uh, one of our passions as a church, and many of you are aware of this, is that th we're blessed with this building. We own this building. We have no debt. God has gifted us with this building. It's been here a long time. And a lot of buildings like this sit empty during the week. There might be programs occasionally, but they basically sit empty. And this is a place where community is. And so we've been able to basically make our church a community center and that's why we have the food pantry in the back that the entire community is involved with, Church Without Walls, and we're able to, to feed the community. A whole bunch of people are coming together every week, seeing God do, work the miracle of food, hand that out, pray for people. It's, it's an awesome thing. So just as a reminder, that's available to serve, but some of us work and we can't. But we have a food focus every week. And next week's food focus is spam. So this is what I want to challenge everybody to do, because we make this announcement every week, and there's a cart back there, but honestly, we're, we're not all living into it. I, I mean, I'll be truthful. I'm guilty. So I want to challenge us. Weird product, right? But some of us love Spam. Spam's great protein. So I want everybody to bring a can of Spam or more next Sunday, and let's overflow the cart like we need to, and we're going to need help rolling the cart to the back, okay? Uh, we value community here. We value relationships with one another. Your burdens ought to be our burdens. And many of you know that Susan's husband, Jerry, passed away uh, a while ago. Was it a month ago? Two months ago. And we want to journey with her in the process of, of grieving and celebrating his life. And so this coming Saturday at 11 a.m., we're going to have a memorial service here for Jerry. And many of you don't know Jerry, but we know Susan. And this is part of her journey. And some of you know that journey. So I'd encourage us to be here. Uh, 11 o'clock next Saturday. It's not in the bulletin, but um, we're going to be here for that, okay? And we, and we love you, Susan. We're praying for you. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, we'll be having lunch in the back afterwards. And then some of you saw me post on, on social media that on Thursday, there was an amazing graduation ceremony in this place. Part of Host House and Naomi's House is being a part of this organization called Cambridge Academies, and they, they help the marginalized. And there's a lot of immigrants in our area that are marginalized. They don't know the language. They don't have education yet. And Cambridge Academies helps them learn English and helps them get their GED. And in this very space, uh, Matt, can you put that picture up? In this very space, there was a graduation celebrating the accomplishment of, I think it was 32, 32 people who work one job, some two jobs, and did this at night to earn their GEDs. And we celebrated that graduation in this space because this is a community space, a community center. So I just want you to know as we move forward as a church, that's our heart, that this space would be used by the community. People would continue to know that they can come to this place and have their needs met. It's not just a place where we do church on Sunday. And then um, lastly, this Tuesday... So the second and fourth Tuesdays, it's a life rhythm that we're trying to get back. Um, we're going to have a, a training, if you want to call it that, on, on how to read the Bible, on how to read the Bible better. Not only for yourself, but I'm going to share with you how you can go about reading the Bible so that you could share that with somebody else. And I guarantee you, even if you've been in Scripture your entire life, 
If you come back there, you're going to get some tools. You're going to get something new that maybe you hadn't thought of that maybe will help your time as you spend time in the Word each day to grow. It's going to be from 7 to 8 o'clock. And if you know me, I don't go over. It's going to be from 7 to 8 o'clock, so get, come a little early. And yes, um, you might want to bring a Bible. Um, <laughs> you might want to bring a Bible, okay? So anyway, those are the announcements um, that I had for today. So if I can have my kids come on up here, we're going to send them out. So kids, come on up here, all our kids, all our kids. And we're in the season of 15 kids one week and four or five the next week. That's just the way it is in our world today, in our world today. Hey, guys. All right. Come on up. Come on up. All right. I want you guys to know them as we get to know one another. So I'm going to have them say their names in the microphone. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming, Olivia. Are you a little shy today? I love it. I have shy days sometimes. Not very often, but come, come, this, come this way. All right. I want to have them introduce themselves. And boy, you guys... Olivia's ready to go. Hot chocolate this morning. So, so that's Olivia. Who are you? Sophia. Sophia. And who are you? Oh, we're being shy too. And who are you? Shelby. Shelby. And who are you? What's your name? No, I'm not named Shelby. Okay, we're being shy today. All right, so I'm going to pray for them, and we're going to send them out with Tiffany and Betsy. And you can tell there's a lot of energy today. I love it. All right, so let's pray for them, and we'll send them out. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up all these kids to you. We love them. You say that we are to come to you with the heart of a child, and that's them. We can learn from them. So I pray as they go and hang out with Tiffany and Betsy that they would learn a little bit more about who you are, and that at some point they would choose to follow Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, go ahead and head out. Head out, go that way. Go that way. All right. Oh, you ready? All right, we'll let that, we'll let that happen. We'll let that happen. He's, uh uh-oh. He likes to be called Batman. Ooh, I like Batman. All right, Batman. Go to the bat cave. Okay. Awesome. All right. So this morning, um, we're going to continue our journey through the Gospel of John. And um, Kristen's going to be sharing with us this morning. So Kristen, why don't you come up here? And um, let me just say this about Kristen. Um, Many of you know that she's a special ed teacher over at Apricot. And she's getting her education in that. And that was hugely valuable during kids camp because we had some kids with special needs who came. And she was a huge gift to uh, us and teaching us how to navigate through that. And then she's also on our leadership team now. And she's a real key leader here in our church. And I love her passion for that. And she spent the entire kids camp week with us every day, all day, uh, living into that. So um, I want to pray for her. And then she's going to share with us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Kristen. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in her life. I thank you for her passion for you, her passion to live that out in the real world each and every day. And Lord, we know that you've been speaking to her this week um, through this passage of scripture. We just pray that it would speak to us. So open up our hearts and our minds that we might receive that which you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Let me get this set up here. I am excited to be here and get to share with you. And um, often, in some feedback that I've received, it turns out when I'm really excited, I talk too fast, and I also have a soft voice, and that doesn't go over very well. So if I'm talking too fast, please just, like, remind me to slow down. Um, If you can't hear me, I will do my best to talk a little louder. Um, that has been kind of the story of my life. Everybody in my entire life has told me to talk louder and I do what I can. So just, you know, laying that foundation for you. Um, Today, we're going to be reading from John 6 verses 1 through 15. And actually, before I start, I just kind of want to like take a minute and set the intention. And next week, I'm going back to work and I'm going to have my students and every day with my students We just like set our intention for the day and we share what we're grateful for. And so um, I know we've gotten to share 
what's brought us joy with each other. And so I just want to share with you that I'm really grateful to be here and to see what God's doing. And um, kids camp was amazing. And we had these awesome young leaders that uh, Peter, even though we were all there and helping out, but just to see them sort of take it and run with them and step into that and uh, fill this role and the way the kids just love them was really cool to see. And um, I had a moment where I got to speak with one of the leaders last week, and um, sorry, Jacob, I'm putting you on the spot, but it was this amazing, like, and, and I'll get into it further in the message, but there were all these questions that I had been wrestling with and praying about all week, and I had this little, you know, we were talking, and this short conversation, and he gave me this quick, unintentionally gave me this quick five-minute sermon, and I was like, there's my answer. Thank you, Pastor Jacob. Thank you, God, for that. And so I just get really excited to see um, people who are excited to love Jesus, people who are excited to learn more. And um, I love to have those conversations. And I love that it doesn't matter how old or how young we are, we can still be learning from those that are older and younger than us. And so that's one of the things I want us to keep in mind as we move into this message. Um, Also, kind of my focus for the day is if we truly believe in a God of the impossible who anticipates and satisfies our needs, are we willing to bring all that we have, trusting him to do the impossible in and through and around us? So just kind of let that hang out in the background. Um, That to me was huge because it was, it is something that I struggle with, you know, like I love Jesus, I have been to church my whole life, I have this faith, Um, and in the last probably seven years, I've really been able to dive into some healing work and to making my faith my own, not just believing what I've been told to believe my whole life, Um, and with that has brought up some really hard questions, like, uh, did Jesus actually raise Lazarus from the dead? Is Jesus... Did he really get raised from the dead? Did he really feed the 5,000? You know, like in our minds, especially living in America today, and, you know, we have everything that we need at the, you know, our fingertips, it's really hard to imagine that these things could actually happen. And what I love about Jesus, what I love about God, is that it doesn't matter. Like, it's okay to have those questions. It's okay to have those doubts. Um, The important thing is that we just keep an open mind and allow him every day to show us. And when we're open to it, so I've always been the kind of person, even as a kid, like, okay, I need a sign. And, you know, of course, way back when, it was like, I really have a crush on this guy, and I need you to give me a sign that we're meant to be. And then I'd look for signs all over, and, of course, it never never worked out. Um, Thank goodness that my um, search for signs and emotional health that I've been able to mature in both and now a lot of those conversations with God is just hey just remind me that you're still in this remind me that whatever it is I'm doing today you're a part of it help me see you I know I've shared with you guys before hearts are everywhere God really loves us and he plants hearts even in the gum outside our classroom doors it can be heart shaped sometimes and that's God's way of saying guess what I love you and it's gonna be okay and when we're aware And when we just kind of maintain and and set that intention for the day, being grateful for everything that we've been given, being grateful, even if we feel in moments like it's not enough, that we have the opportunity to be here, right? We have the opportunity to show up in whatever aspects and whatever circumstances our life brings, and that for God, that's enough. And we can then be looking forward to what he's going to do in and through us. Um, Sometimes that looks different than we expect it to or want it to or imagine it to, but as I've looked back over my life over the years, often when I've been in the midst of something that I feel is impossible or maybe God's just kind of forgotten about it or doesn't really care, when I'm removed from it and can take a look back, I can see that everything that was going on in that moment was exactly what I needed it to be and where I needed to be in order for him to do what he needed to do, usually in me, because it's usually a lesson that I'm supposed to learn. Um, And the way his answers come in ways that I never expected or imagined. Um, Sometimes it's just those reminders that, hey, I love you. It's that 
perfectly timed phone call or text message, um, a conversation or a hug from a friend. Other times it's something more tangible. Seven years ago when I separated from my husband and our bank account was closed and I didn't have any money, I remember kind of freaking out and like, what did I just do? And God, really? And now this is, how am I going to feed my kids? And um, as I've shared, the circumstances of that were not pretty. And there were a lot of people in my church that were not happy about it. And in that moment where I was sort of isolating and feeling like the whole world is against me because I've done this terrible thing, somebody from the church unexpectedly sent me a beautiful card letting me know how much they loved me, how much they had my back. That didn't mean they condoned the circumstances or what I was doing, but they were still in it with me. And in that card was a gift card for Save Mart, so I was able to buy groceries. And in that moment, I was like, okay, it's going to be okay. My kids are not going to go hungry. I mean, my parents live around the corner, so if we really needed to, we can go over there. <laughs> but, but, you know, like it's, it, there was moments where I don't want to have to ask my parents. I'm a, I'm a grown-up. I should be able to do this. And I didn't know what was going to happen, and yet God still provides, just like he did for his people way back when, um, and he's continuing to do that. So let's um, go ahead and read from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing what they had intended, that they had ten, intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. God, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for these amazing stories that people were willing to take the time to write down for us so that here we are, generations later, we can still see um, the wonderful miracles that you performed through Jesus and his disciples and um, can make those connections and look forward to seeing you at work today in our lives. I just pray right now that you would open our hearts and minds to hearing what you would have us hear. Um, not me, not my will, not my words, but yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ooh, lost my place. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on in this story. Um, as we've been going through the book of John, we've been seeing, you know, Jesus met the woman at the well. The disciples weren't sure why they would go through Samaria, but it was really important that they made that stop. And because of that encounter and the encounter with her people, this whole community was saved and lives were changed. We see him continually healing people, you know, people with leprosy, people who are blind, um, these people were gathering. It says that they were traveling because it was the Passover. And so people would travel for miles and miles to get to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover together with their people. And so uh, Jesus knew all of these people are traveling. They're going to be hungry. They've probably been walking a really long time. Um, and yet on their way, they were hearing stories of Jesus. And they knew if they could just get close to him in some cases. If I can just touch his cloak, if I can just hear a word, I know that I can be healed. And so everywhere he went, these large crowds started gathering. And so something that's really important is Jesus totally 
He was grounded and knew how important his time with the Father was. Just like Peter mentioned this morning, that devotion time, the getting away to pray. I mean, this is Jesus, right? We're like, oh, but Jesus is God, so he should be fine. But Jesus needed that time. He would often, after being with a large crowd or even with his disciples, he would get away by himself to go meditate and pray because he knew that it was important for him to sit and regroup and hear a word from the Father. And so this time is a moment in their travels where he has this quiet moment with his close group of friends and he's taking that time. They all need to rest. They all need to regroup and prepare for whatever God's doing next. And as it turns out, God was bringing them a lovely crowd of people who were hungry. And so um, these people are coming and Jesus sees the crowd, like I said, knows that they're hungry and decides that they need to do something about it. Because I think, you know, if we're really paying attention to this, yes, there's a food miracle. Yes, they're physically hungry. But I think beyond that, too, um, as we're seeing in all these other stories, Jesus knew of this spiritual hunger that was within their hearts, that there was this need and this desire. They followed him because they knew whether he was healing or giving them food or not, what he had to say was different and his way of life was different and it was something that was shocking, something they had never seen before, but it was something that was so good. And just like the woman at the well with the living water that Jesus had to offer, these people knew that Jesus had this sort of living bread that could be offered. So Jesus knows that in this moment, that's, that's what we need to take care of. But instead of just, like Moses, going to the Father, asking for manna to rain down from heaven, give us some quail, help us have a meal, he invites other people to join him in this miracle that's about to take place. So he turns to his disciples. Philip, um, we are told, is from the area, so it would be hey, you live here, where can we get some food for these people? And Philip is like, uh, there's no way. We don't have enough money, we don't have enough time, we'd have to go, you know, it just, everyone could have a bite and that's it. And probably not even that, because not only, the Bible says there's 5,000 men, but that's because women and children didn't count. So men, with their wives and children, were traveling for the Passover. So that means not only were there 5,000 men, if even half of those men were married, that's another, what, 2,500 people? And if any of them even had one child, again, another 2,500 on top. This is a huge crowd of people who are hungry. And so Philip isn't sure. Philip sees this impossible situation and is just like, nope, we got to send them home. Tell them to go figure it out for themselves because we can't do it. Andrew, on the other hand, also sees this impossible situation, but was like, hey, so I've been hanging out with this kid, and he has a snack, so maybe you can do something with that, but maybe not, I don't know, probably not, but let's try. So he gives this kid and the snack to Jesus. Something really cool that I learned, and um, this is something that spoke to me this week, the boy, it's very clear that he has barley loaves. Barley back in the day, was considered the grain of the animals. You didn't eat barley unless you were very, very poor, or if you had committed a terrible sin of the animals, such as a woman who committed adultery. She would make barley loaves and she would bring them to the altar as a, a trespass or sin offering to make herself holy again. And so barley is not among God's people, not seen as high quality food that people of God should be feeding. And yet the boy comes with his barley loaves with everything that he has and is willing to share. Also these fish, um, they're not fresh fish. They're not like luxurious, like giant ocean fish. They're basically sardines that help the barley bread go down better. So because the barley bread is so dry. So what he has is these teeny little loaves of animal food and two tiny little fish. But Andrew saw something in him in this connection and has been watching Jesus and knows anything's possible with this guy. That's why we're following him around. And Jesus, of course, accepts what is given with gladness, um, doesn't shame him or condemn him or say, hey, can you find someone else? You know, can you maybe ask around, see if we have any olives that we can throw in here? Um, instead, he accepts it because just like in the story of the, the widow um, in Luke 21, where it says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. 
And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all out of their surplus put into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And here's this boy from a poor family with his little snack because he's traveling a long way and kids get hungry. Kids always want a snack. Um, He's willing to give Jesus all that he had in order to share with others and hope that others will be blessed because of it. In that moment, we can see that we should never, ever be ashamed of anything that we can bring to the table. I think as Christians, um, and I've heard <laughs> in the church, you know, oh, well, this person's so gifted, and, and that person is so wise, and oh, well, I'm just, you know, spiritually, like, you're way ahead of me, and it's like, it's this competition, right? Like, we're just not quite there yet, and people are so afraid to bring what they have because maybe it's not quite enough, and it's really sad, but it's also something that maybe the church in some circumstances has created, you know, and just like then with the Pharisees, they would have frowned upon the barley loaves, they would have frowned upon the two copper coins because it wasn't enough. But Jesus never frowns on it. Jesus sees the heart and sees that this kid and this woman and these people are coming and they just want to give because they love, because they want to be a part of the bigger picture. And they're, they're coming and they're not afraid and they're just showing up knowing he's going to do amazing things. Ephesians 3 verses 20 and 21 says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Okay, not just what we can ask for, but beyond what we can even imagine. According to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So Ephesians was written like the rest of this a couple thousand years ago. And yet right there, for generations and generations were written about, that this generation can still do great things when we allow the Spirit of God to work in us and through us. That God wants us to show up with our barley loaves, right, with our two copper coins, and just say, okay, I'm here. I want to give out of the abundance of my love, not necessarily the abundance of my things, because I may not have a lot of things. But he just wants us to show up. The power, Jesus tells later in John, we're going to see, he tells his disciples, you're going to do greater things than I have because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Right now is just training for them. Jesus is modeling the life that he wants them to live and he's empowering them to go and do. Just like inviting Philip, Andrew, this little boy. He's not saying, I'm here, I'm, you know, the, the people wanted to make him the king because they see him doing these great things, but Jesus doesn't want to be their king. Jesus wants to show them how to create his kingdom, how to be used by God, how to step into the lives of others and be a blessing. And so in this moment, Jesus doesn't take on all the power and do it himself. He invites the little boy to bring what he has, and through the boy, he's able to bless everyone else. With that in mind, some of us here today may be, like me, (laughs) struggling to wrap your head around the miracle, right? Like, perhaps this didn't really happen, maybe they exaggerated, maybe it's a metaphor. All of those things, I think, are normal questions for our logical brains because our brains need answers, and when we don't understand something, we create answers to make ourselves feel better. So... That could be, you know, maybe it didn't. Maybe there was, it was something, maybe the little boy being willing to share sparked something. William Barclay says maybe that ignited in others this um, desire to also share what they had. So they were able to pull out whatever snacks they had left over and because of that, feed everybody. Who knows? And in that, if that's the case, then the miracle is the change of hearts that the people experienced. Either way, there's still a miracle and it was still prompted by this little boy. Um, we may be sitting in the midst of a seemingly impossible situation. Uh, sometimes in life, we go through hard times, right? Sometimes those seasons are really long. And even if they're short seasons, when they're really dark, we just want to get through them and we just want to know, okay, what's next, what's next? And like I shared last week in my conversation with Jacob, I had been wrestling with this. There's, 
been this thing in my life that's been very daunting and it's been this struggle of mine. And at first I was like, yeah, super hopeful and I know that God can do anything and just remind me, remind me, remind me. And then I'm like, okay, well, it's been like a couple of months. Okay, now it's been a year. Now it's been a year and a half. Maybe I need to just let this thing go because God clearly isn't in this. And it's discouraging when you're in that space because you feel sort of abandoned, right? But then we remember that God would never lead a, leave us or forsake us. He's always leading us. And so in that conversation, like I said, it was a huge blessing to me because I was reminded in this God of the impossible that just because I can't see what he's up to doesn't mean he's not up to something. And sometimes we get impatient. We're very impulsive. Uh, we like instant gratification. And when God takes his time, just like he did with Jesus, the people had been waiting for hundreds of years for a Messiah, and Jesus came along, and then he wasn't looking like what they expected, right? But he was still there, and God still had a plan to use him for. So maybe in the midst of an impossible situation, can we just let go of what we want to have happen and trust that God is still the God of the impossible? The story of the rich young ruler um, reminds us that You know, as he goes away sad, like, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, I have to give up all that I have, and I have so much, and this is heartbreaking. And the disciples ask Jesus about this, and he just tells them, sure, like, it's really hard. And with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And if we can claim that truth in our own lives, that can be this little spark of hope that in the seemingly impossible impossible (laughs) situations— there's, it gives us that drive to keep going because we know that on the other side of this, we're going to look back and see all the ways that God's hand was in it the whole time. Some of us may be resisting, stepping out in faith, believing that what you have to offer isn't quite enough. And like I said, this, especially if you've been in the church or you've observed the church and you've seen people and like, oh, well, that person's a great leader. I don't know. I don't have any gifts or skills. Uh, No, because you were wonderfully and beautifully created and crafted by God with a purpose. Last week we were hearing about how every single one of us has a purpose. We were all created with this mission in mind, right? That if we're willing to join God in whatever it is he's wanting us to do and not try to have the answers but just step into it with reckless abandon, that he wants to do amazing things through us. And we may not even know what those things are. We may not feel this call in our lives, but everybody has a call. And when we are right with God, when, and when I say right with God, I don't mean like we are, you know, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's and following all the rules. Right with God means we're just taking that time to find our security in him. We're not running around in our insecurity trying to figure it out ourselves and driving ourselves into the ground trying to serve in areas that we're not gifted. No, we have a specific call. Everybody's been gifted in specific ways because we don't, you know, when he he talks about the body, right? We're the body. He doesn't need everybody to be a hand because then how are we going to get anywhere? So we all are gifted in different ways. It's not a competition. He just needs everybody to show up. So right now, Maybe in this moment, if you're afraid or you're resisting because you feel like what you have isn't enough, you need to let go of that fear and just trust in the God of the impossible. William Barclay, in his um, commentary on the Gospel of John, I'm going to read this to you because I felt like I might flub it up if I tried to do it myself. Um, I loved this. He says, Jesus needs what we can bring him. It may not be much, but he needs it. It may well be that the world is denied miracle after miracle and triumph after triumph because we will not bring to Jesus what we have and what we are. If we would lay ourselves on the altar of his service, there is no saying what he could do with us and through us. We may be sorry and embarrassed that we have not more to offer, but that is no reason for failing to bring what we have. Little is always much in the hands of Christ." just like the widow, just like the boy. Little is always much. And that the world may be denied miracles and triumphs because we're afraid, that makes me want to get over myself, get over my fears, and just take that risk, that little tiny leap of faith. It doesn't have to be huge. The other thing is maybe some of us are placing God in a box. 
right? These people, they see Jesus. He's doing these amazing things. He must be the person we're waiting for. Let's make him a king because we have an agenda. We need him to defeat the Roman Empire, and this guy we know can do it. So let's make him our king, and then he'll do everything we need him to do, and we'll be saved. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's not for me because that's not what I'm about. And a lot of us, and I've heard in a lot of conversations, God would never do that. God doesn't work that way. That's not the way it works. But who are we to say what God can and cannot do? Who are we to define who he is or what he should be about, right? Because he's so much bigger. Like Ephesians says, (laughs) more than we can think, more than we can imagine, and he's willing and able to do so much more if we allow him. When we make Jesus a king, when we put God in a box, we're limiting what we allow him to do. We can no longer see all the amazing things he's up to because we've decided he can only do this and we need him to do this. But maybe if we were be willing to like, take down just one side of the box and let him walk out, he can really impress us and show us these other ways that he's wanting to, to move in our community, move in our homes, move in our own lives, and maybe he wants us to be a part of that. So all this being said, like I said in the beginning, Are we willing to trust in a God who anticipates our needs and invites us into being a part of his miracle, the miracle that he's waiting to perform? Can we trust him? And as I've said before, I'm going to say it again because it's so important. Whatever you bring is enough because you are enough. God has chosen you in all of your flaws and all of your chaos to be exactly what he needs you to be in this moment. He doesn't expect you to have all the answers. You are enough. What you have and who you are is worthy of use by him. He just wants you to get involved. And you are so very loved. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will never tell you that what you have isn't good enough. He will never ask you to, you know, maybe grab someone else because they can do it better. He wants you And would you be willing to show up bringing only you and whatever that looks like and from there allow God to do the impossible? So that is what I have for you today. Um, As we always do, just take a minute, kind of reflect on what it is that you're hearing and what does God want you to do with what you heard. So we're going to sing this song as a response to what we've heard. It's going to remind us of some truths that um, Kristen pointed to. So may this uh, song as we sing it just be a prayer. And know that God, and he can do anything. He can do anything. All that we see that might be impossible, he can do it. He can do it through us, he can do it in us, and he can do it around us. Those miracles are there for us each and every day. He's placed you purposely in your circumstances because he wants to use you in that way. So you can stand if you want, you can stay seated, whatever works for you. This is going to be a prayer, a song. Before Luke 
by the sound of his voice. Seas that ushered in and stood, and becalmed and broken from my regard. Through it all. word today. God still can do the impossible. So with that being said, um, I want everybody to sit for a minute because I want certain individuals to stand out. School starts next week. And uh, we've got a lot of teachers in this place and we've got a lot of students in this place. We've got people that are going back to school. I love it, Jay. Um, And that can be a daunting task, especially if you're a teacher diving in. So if you're a teacher, would you stand up, please? Because we want to pray for you. Just stand up right where you are. If you're a teacher or a coach, don't be shy. Stand up. Teacher, stand up. Stand up. If you're a student going back to school, stand up. If you're a student, I see students in the room. Jay, stand up. doesn't matter how old you are or whether in all of that. So stand up. Josiah, yeah, great to have you. All right. I just want to pray for you guys. And um, if, if you're near one of these folks, if you're near one of these folks, could you do me a favor? Because I, I really believe there's power in it. I mean, Jesus touched people and things happen. So if you could just put your hand on their shoulder and just, you know, uh, I just want to pray for students and I want to pray for teachers because this is, uh, we've got a big year coming up here. 
All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray a special blessing on every teacher in this room, every coach. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just bless them beyond measure. I thank you for their faithfulness and their love for kids and that their desire is to be in the lives of young people and point them in the right direction. So I pray that you would help them to do greater things this year than they even ever imagined. And may they experience strength and encouragement and hope and optimism and joy, patience, gentleness, kindness that comes from you. And Lord, I know you can do that. Lord, I want to pray for all the students that are going back. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to get back into the life routine of waking up and going and being and and doing the diligent work that's going to prepare them for the life ahead. Give them that strength. Give them that discipline that they need right now to do that. And Lord, whatever challenges they face um, this week and in the weeks and the months to come, Lord, I pray that they would know that you are with them and that you will help them overcome all of it. May they feel a deep sense of your presence. And Lord, for the rest of us as just people in this community, may we always be praying for and looking for opportunities to support and love those who serve kids. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think that was a good blessing. I think that covered us all. So um, I want to encourage us to hang out. You can hang out as long as you want. Uh, remember th- this Saturday, um, if, you, if you can make it to come and join with us as we, as we um, journey with Susan and celebrating her husband Jerry's life. And then the Bible thing this Tuesday from 7 to 8. Seriously, show up. It's going to be a great time. I love sh- sharing this stuff with folks. We'll be in the back from 7 to 8 o'clock. But otherwise, have a great week and, and live into whatever God calls you to this week. Amen? All right. You are.